Okay, so we might get started. Um, so good afternoon and welcome to the Australian Centre for Value-Based Healthcare webinar. The journey of ACAT to value-based healthcare, co-designing a community-centred and outcome-focused, culturally responsive model of care. I'm Emma Hoban, Policy Manager at the Australian Healthcare and Hospital Association, and it's my pleasure to be your host today. Before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners of the lands on the many lands on which we meet today, and I recognise their continuing connection to land, cultural and water. I am currently on the land of the Ngunnawal people here in Canberra and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We would also like to thank HESTA, who have been our supporters of this webinar today. They are a long-standing and valued partner of the Australian Healthcare and Hospital Association, and we are very grateful for their support. Um, I will hand now over to Tom Maloney, the National Manager Key Stakeholder Relations from HESTA, to say a few words. Thank you, Emma. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to say a few brief words at this webinar uh, today. I too would like to acknowledge that I meet you on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to extend that respect to any other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here present on the webinar. Um, HESTA is incredibly proud to partner with the AAHA and we've had a long-standing fruitful relationship um, as a person who works closely with the AAHA team, it gives me great pride to be able to work with them um, daily and uh, we are grateful that they put on extraordinary learning such as this um, and it's so pleasing that we can hear from two wonderful speakers today on not only value-based uh, value -based healthcare but cultural responsiveness. Uh, we are grateful for AAHA's commitment and advocacy to uh, improving the lives of so many across the country and empowering people working in the health system. Uh, it is this leadership and advocacy that um, we are so proud to be a part of as a partner. I'd like to share one very brief story about how at HESTA we are um, supporting positive change and in particular through um, cultural safety and uh, tr traditional owner groups, in particular focusing on the mining sector. This year HESTA made a significant contribution to an ongoing process for new legislative national standards to protect cultural heritage in Australia. It comes off the, the back of the Dukan Gorge tragedy where in, um, a couple of years ago Rio Tinto destroyed 46,000 year old culturally significant caves in the Pilbara region. And with it, it, they destroyed the trust of traditional owner groups across the country. As a result, in May 2022, we made a submission to the government's inquiry to apply the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples principles in Australian legislation. This establishes a universal framework of minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of the world's indigenous peoples. Hester believes applying these in Australia can improve long-term social and financial outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and improve long-term economic outcomes for our investors and our members. This is a critical step to ensuring the companies we invest in have respectful, and sustainable long-term partnerships with Indigenous communities across the country and that any agreements entered into provide fair outcomes to all parties. And whilst this is just one example, it gives you a sense as to how aligned we are with the AAHA to ensure um, the rights of traditional owners and First Nations people are respected uh, in this country. We are very proud to partner with the AAHA and we know they share the same values uh, for public health care and to be able to empower people who work for them and the communities they serve. On behalf of everyone at HESTA, we thank you for your amazing contributions. And I really look forward to hearing two amazing speakers, Sorrel and Abby, as they share their experience. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Tom, and thank you again, HESTA, for your generous support of this webinar. Um, so, Today we are sharing with you the journey of the aged care assessment team within the Cairns and Hinterland Health and Hospital Services, who over the last couple of years has embarked on a journey of change, reorientating their model of care to better meet the needs of communities they serve. We will have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but feel free to ask your questions as they occur to you via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I would now like to welcome our two um, fantastic speakers today, First, we're joined by Sorrel Doherty. Sorrel is an occupational therapist with over 15 years experience 
working in both clinical and management roles within the community, aged and disability care sector. She has worked in metropolitan, regional and rural areas around Queensland and has a special interest in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and change management. Terrell was an ACAT assessor for seven years and previously the team leader for the Far North Queensland ACAT and Memory Services. She's currently the team leader for Adult Community Health Services across Cairns. We will also be joined by Abby Root, who is an occupational therapist who has worked in metropolitan, regional and remote areas of Queensland for over 10 years. She has clinical experience working with an Aboriginal community controlled health organisation, as well as hospital and community settings in the public health sector. Abby is passionate about delivering quality aged care services and culturally safe healthcare to the First Nations peoples and has worked for the Cairns Aged Care Assessment Team from 2020 until recently. Abby now works in a specialist dementia care role and maintains a strong clinical interest in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. I will now pass over to Sorrel, um, who will um, present the fantastic journey that they've been on. Thanks, Sorrel. Thanks, Emma. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, all right. Um, so um, we're really Abby and I are really excited to share our story. Um, about how we um, changed our service um, for both the community of Yarrabah and um, our Cape communities. So first we're going to talk about how we developed a face-to-face -face model of care with a discrete Aboriginal community, so that's Yarrabah just outside of Cairns, um, and then we're going to talk, go on and talk about how we applied these learnings um, to develop a telehealth model of care in the Cape York Peninsula. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, thank you to Emma for the um, acknowledgement of country. Um, we would also like to pay a special thanks to the communities we partnered with, without whom this work would not have been possible. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people dialing in today. Um, so we're going to use the um, allied health framework for value based healthcare to outline the key elements of our model of care and our approach to developing this model. Um, this model, so our model of care was developed prior to the development and production of the framework, um, but we really felt it was an excellent fit for the key ingredients of value based healthcare. Um, and you can see the diagram in the slide. We're going to use those headings to take you on the journey of um, how we uh, developed and, impl and implemented the models of care. Um, I was really fortunate to be part of the working group who had input into the development of the framework. Um, and I put forward this model of care as a case study to be included in the framework document, which um, it fortunately has been. So it's, it's been a really um, ex exciting uh, experience for us. So I thought I'd start by giving people a bit of a background about ACAT. I didn't want to assume that um, people knew what ACAT was about. So ACAT stands for the Aged Care Assessment Team. Um, the service in Cairns is a multidisciplinary clinical team who provides assessment services for older people. Um, so our assessors support clients and carers to access Commonwealth funded aged care services. Um, this can include residential care, home care packages, um, and transition care and restorative care. Um, so the ACAT team sits within Queensland Health, um, but it's funded uh, by the Commonwealth Government. Um, we receive most referrals via My Age Care. So My Age Care is, I guess, the umbrella organisation um, funded by the Commonwealth Government uh, that gives people, older people, access to um, Commonwealth funded supports and services. So it's made up of a website, an online portal, which is where referrals, assist, assessments and client information sits, um, and a contact centre. Um, assessors use a comprehensive assessment tool, the NSAF, um, to assess clients. So our 
this, this sort of outlines our business as usual process. For the majority of clients seeking um, assessment, the entry point to ACAT is via referral to My Age Care. Um, referrals are triaged by a rostered intake officer. Um, this person changes daily. So once the referral is accepted, uh, they're allocated to an assessor within the My Age Care portal. Uh, the assessor is responsible for reviewing the referral and booking the assessment. Assessments are generally completed face-to-face -face in the client's home. This did change during COVID where we had to move to a phone assessment model, but we've um, returned to business as usual now. Once the assessment is finalised and the client is approved for the supports they need, um, the assessor creates a support plan and an approval letter. And this is um, meant to be a client document um, using, uh, I guess, language um, that's accessible for the client. The documents are either posted or emailed to the client or are nominated next of kin. And once those documents are mailed out, the client's discharged from the service. So um, just to give you a bit of more of a context about the area that the Cairns ACAT team services. So um, we have offices located in Cairns Innisfail, which is south of Cairns and Mareeba, which is west on the tablelands. Um, the Cairns ACAT service looks after both the Cairns and Hinterland region and also the Torres and Cape region. So it's quite a large area. Um, we are super fortunate to have a Torres Strait Islander health worker who does our assessments for clients living in the Torres Strait Islands. Um, and she lives in that area. She's, um, I think, a, a very respected person in the community and very well known. So it, it's a really culturally safe and appropriate model of care. Um, we currently don't provide face-to-face -face assessments for clients residing in the Cape York communities. And we'll talk a bit more about that later in the presentation. Um, so it's really helpful to have an awareness of the demographics of far north Queensland and how this compares to the rest of um, the state. So you can see from the figures in this slide, the Cairns and Hinterland and Torres and Cape areas have significantly higher proportions of First Nations people compared to the rest of Queensland. Um, so Torres and Cape have 67% of the population identifying as First Nations. So this really illustrates how important it is for mainstream health services looking after these areas to really tailor care to the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I'll move on to talking about Yarrabah, which is um, where we started with our model of care. So Yarrabah is a discrete First Nations community. It's predominantly um, Aboriginal um, and it's uh, about an hour's drive from Cairns. Uh, the population is over 2,550 people, but it's likely more uh, because of the fairly transient nature of the population. Um, there are people from many different family groups in the community and um, different mobs as well. So this slide, I guess, shows you the key stakeholders in healthcare and service provision in Yarrabah for people aged 50 years and over. So, uh, from a Commonwealth perspective, um, eligibility for aged care services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is 50 years and over, compared with 65 years and over for um, non-Indigenous people. So Girini Yalamaka is the um, Aboriginal Health Service. It's a non-Queensland health um, medical service. Uh, the service provider Mutkin provides both um, aged care and disability care services under NDIS and also operates residential care beds um, located in the community. Um, Queensland Health uh, provides Commonwealth Home Support Program services, so that's occupational therapy and continence nursing services, and that's um, sort of an outreach service from Cairns. Uh, there is a Queensland Health Emergency Department, which is connected to Girini um, physically. And um, Queensland Health also provides um, visiting specialists from Cairns. So there's a variety of services offered there. So in line with the value-based healthcare framework, it's really important to consider the political environment surrounding the area of healthcare you wish to transform. So the documents in this slide really inform the development of our model of care. Um, we noticed some really uh, key themes within these documents. So those included barriers for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, that are 
these people face when trying to access aged care services, including assessment, um, the need to ensure cultural safety when delivering services, um, the huge impact of workforce shortages, particularly in remote communities, and also the requirement for increased community consultation and co-design of services with First Nations people and communities. Um, so I guess the fact that improving care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities is a key strategic objective for the health service that Abby and I um, worked in within ACAT was a really significant enabler for getting support higher up within our organisation um, for you know, the implementation and design of our model of care and being able to put resources towards that. So on to step one, where do we start? So we started by identifying an opportunity for change. Um, we noticed several issues impacting on clients living in Yarrabah and their access to um, aged care services. Um, so we had really low referral numbers, despite knowing that Yarrabah has an aging population and high rates of disability and chronic disease. Um, it was often challenging to contact the clients directly. Um, in Yarrabah, um, there's really poor internet and phone um, reception. A lot of clients didn't have mobile phones or a telephone and the post system's quite unreliable. Um, so when we did get referrals, there were really high rates of client non-attendance at assessments. Um, based on feedback from uh, the community, the referral process to ACAT was really unclear. Um, the My Aged Care portal is pretty well known for being a barrier for clients and family members accessing care, especially if they've not got experience navigating it and don't have someone to assist them. Um, the relationships between ACAT and the key health and service organisations within Yarrabah weren't well established. Um, this impacted on communication and also the availability of local people to help ACAT with assessments. Um, we'd also unfortunately noticed a number of potentially avoidable hospital admissions for residents of Yarrabah. Um, this was often as a result of care stress and lack of access to supports. Um, and this resulted in really poor outcomes for the clients who were coming into hospital. So the opportunity for change was not only identified by us, but also through feedback from Girini and Mutkin. So we all recognised that something needed to change in order to have better outcomes for the clients. So the next step was to understand the care pathway and shared needs of the key stakeholders involved. So this whole process started back in March last year, um, and we began with the process of community consultation. It was a really organic process, and it was initiated by both us in ACAT and Girini, and there was a lot of um, backwards and forwards informal feedback from both services. Um, Abby and I drew on our previous experience to inform the process. So um, as Emma said um, with the introduction, Abby's had previous experience working for um, community controlled health services. And she had a really good understanding of the dynamics of those services and also what would potentially work. Um, I'd had experience using a community driven consultative process in order to improve ACAT services um, where I'd previously worked in Roma for Southwest Queensland. Um, and these are quite rural and remote areas. So initially, Abby and I met with the team at Girini for a very informal question and answer session about the ACAT service. Um, the discussions were very much led by the health workers, the nurses and the doctors in, from Girini at that meeting. Um, and Abby and I were really conscious to go into the meeting with no preconceived ideas about what they needed and what would work. So the focus on the meeting was really to share information, to learn from each other about each other's services and to share ideas about what might work moving forwards. So from this meeting, we agreed to try having an ACAT assessor, so Abby, visit Yarrabah on a regular basis um, and to work collaboratively with the staff at Girini to coordinate and complete assessments. So uh, I guess what we wanted to talk a bit about the enablers and barriers. So I think I've mentioned quite a few of the enablers already. Um, the process was community led from the get go. Um, we really focused on building trust with the community and the local service provider. 
Um, as a manager, I gave Abby the autonomy to organically develop the model of care and also to be guided by the community. Um, I was really aware of her strengths and previous experience and that she was a really good match for undertaking this work. Um, a key challenge to developing and implementing this model was um, the ACAT service was and continues to be under a really high amount of pressure due to, so referrals to the service have pretty much doubled within a one to two year period. We've had no increase in staffing and resources. I'm sure this is super familiar to a lot of people listening. Um, so due to this pressure, we were challenged by a number of team members within the ACAT team who were really questioning why we were dedicating an assessor um, to looking after this community and why we were putting resources into developing the model. So I really encourage very open conversations with this, these team members about why it was important. I challenged some of their, um, I guess, notions and ideas around why we shouldn't be doing it. Um, this is a community that we service, we should be doing it well. Um, and Abby did a presentation to the team during a team meeting, which really highlighted the need for a different way of working with the Yarrabah community. And we did end up with good buy-in from the rest of the team. So I'll hand over to Abby um, to talk about the, the guts of what we actually did. <laughs> Thanks, Sorel. Um, and sorry, I'm not joining you with my camera today, guys. Um, I'm in isolation and uh, we have some dodgy internet here, but I'm, I'm, I'm here on the voice. So, um, so thank you, Sorel. Designing for outcomes. So um, whilst those first steps that Sorel was talking about are centred around understanding the client's current journey and really understanding each of our roles, um, in that, um, this next step, designing for outcomes, is where we could but then begin restructuring the way that we deliver care around the community's needs with a more flexible approach. Uh, no. So the most important factor for me was um, practicing relationship focused care. So um, what that means for me as a clinician is that at a grassroots level, there is a genuine relationship with the people that I serve and who I work with. Um, and as somebody who is not an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, the importance of that is magnified significantly. Um, it's an ongoing process to work towards cultural safety, you know, in my practice. And I do that through the process of critical reflection. But ultimately, the only person that can determine whether you're a culturally safe practitioner is the person or community that you're working with. Um, we redefined the meaning of team and, and shifted that focus from the ACAT clinician being the expert in aged care to the community being experts in how they need that care and assessment service delivered. Um, and this meant that the health workers and I worked together on visits to make sure that the client felt both culturally safe and informed about accessing care. They needed to receive information in a way that was meaningful and relatable to them and feel confident to talk about you know, the help that they needed with me. Um, and it was the health workers that made that possible. So <clears throat> finding flexibility uh, in an existing structure, um, the aged care system is a national framework and, and it's got quite rigid structures. Um, but what we were able to do is identify where there could be flexibility in that system. And we, we thought we found opportunity at three points. So the point of referral um, in how the assessments carried out, and then we were able to use the existing system functions for support plan reviews to create these scheduled reminders for uh, follow up in six months time. And um, so we could review whether the home care package had been allocated, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. And um, we set up communication pathways that worked better for everyone. Um, having an ACAT assessor present you know, consistently in community was a key element of this. And it allowed for easy discussions and consultation about the aged care system in general, as well as, um, you know, client related inquiries. And it, it just sort of created this natural format, forum for knowledge sharing between all of us. Um, the introduction of a structured in-person case conference each fortnight as well, um, provided a fantastic opportunity for, for all of us to build those organizational relationships. And it was a really efficient use of time for us all um, to discuss referrals or clinical concerns about vulnerable clients. It, it just meant that we were all on the same page. <clears throat> um, all three of our organisations were, were really driven for change and very invested in improving the outcomes for 
older people living in Yarrabah. Um, we, we had passionate clinicians on the ground and, and staff who were really um, supported and empowered from management and, and from community. And, and one of the key factors is that we were just all open to learning from each other. And we, we maintained this solution focused mindset the whole way through. And so the Yarrabah model of care developed um, quite naturally. From, from an ACAT point of view and perspective, our overarching goal was to improve access to aged care assessment and services for people in Yarrabah. And, and we approached this in, in two ways. Um, first, we changed how we interacted with our clients and we focused on the client journey. And second, we changed how we interacted with our stakeholders who became our colleagues. So, these next two slides is how the new client journey looked from the point of referral to accessing care. Um, we've, we found flexibility at the point of referral and made it easier for people to refer. Um, although we continue to accept referrals sort of through the My Age Care portal, you know, more often than not, the referral would involve uh, a verbal discussion from the nurse and the health worker at Grinney um, once that client has consented. And we would talk about eligibility um, or, or check to see if they'd already got approvals. Um, then they'd just fill out this two page community referral form um, and print off a GP summary and it could all be done there and then. Um, the meet and greet home visit was a key change in the process um, and this was aimed at working towards improving cultural safety at the first point of contact. And this meant the health worker could introduce me to the client and together we could just explain the process of my role in a way that felt relevant and it felt meaningful. Often um, those referrals to ACAT might have come after a health check and so they could relate it back to that. Um, the health worker might say something like, you know, um, when you had the health check last week, you said you were getting a bit short winded um, nowadays and you need in a hand with the yard or the meals or shopping. Um, and then they might say, well, this lady's here to talk to you about all of that and see if we can get you some help. Um, I made sure to provide written information for clients. Um, about my aged care or carer gateway and I always provided my contact details too um, and, and this meant really that that person was given informed consent to have an ACAT assessment um, and normally we would book it in for the following week um, and that, that meant gave them time to organise family to be there and to support them too. <clears throat> so on the day of assessment um, it's it's not unusual for that assessment to be completed over multiple visits. Um, at that in initial meet and greet home visit, uh, I was likely to be provided with lots of context and I would often write that down and I'd save that for the comprehensive assessment or that NSAF that Sarah was talking about. Um, so the client doesn't have to repeat themselves with all that sort of information. Um, and, you know, I'd partner with the health worker to complete the assessment in a, in a culturally sensitive way. Um, that was really important. Um, I'd often ask the team at Gurini um, and the health workers beforehand in the car about particular issues, um, like if there's concerns about medication compliance or if there's care stress or any family dynamics that I needed to be aware of and either leave those questions out or find creative ways to obtain that information if it was important to their care and their goals. Um, men's business and women's business was really sensitively discussed. And issues like continence can often be a taboo subject, but it's an important part of what we do. Um, and so we were just careful with how we, we approach that. Um, my approach to assessment is uh, typically a conversational style um, with use of open ended questions. Um, I might say something like, oh, so tell me what's been happening or talk me through a typical day for you. Or if Mookin could you give you a, just a few hours a week of help, what, what would be most helpful? And by that way, I could gauge um, what was happening and what was most important to the person in this way. It's, it's quite a non-threatening and, um, and you're not asking them to just list all the things that aren't working well. It sort of feels more, more non-judgmental. Um, changes to thinking and memory um, need to be carefully discussed too. Um, it's an important part of what we do and, and then the assessment, but um, I relied on the health workers for guidance around this. Uh, there's some families that have got really significant cultural beliefs around the aging process and um, and asking direct questions about dementia would have been quite inappropriate for those families. So I might say something like, uh, have you noticed any changes to your thinking or memory or how are you feeling in yourself? You're, you're happy or you're sad or lonely most of the time and you can gauge from there. And um, because there was often barriers in accessing respite, 
both um, you know, availability of beds and funding, um, at this point, I'd always recommend an early referral to Carer Gateway um, for anyone that wanted to access uh, respite. So although that ACAT assessor focus is, um, is on completing ACAT assessments, um, a big part of the role was around troubleshooting problems associated with my aged care. A common problem um, was that clients had existing approvals, but they hadn't uptaken their home care package because they didn't get the letter from MAC. Um, as Cyril's already mentioned, there's no the, the post delivery in Yarrabah um, is unreliable. There's no um, post delivery, it's PO boxes. Um, and so with consent, at this particular stage, I would uh, change the correspondence address to the Gurini, the health service, so that that home care package letter got sent to them in six months time. And then it would be treated by the Gurini team as a recall, and then they can help facilitate the uptake. Um, so after I'd done all my write up, I would, I would go back out to do another home visit on my next visit to Yarrabah and deliver the documents in person. Um, I'll always go through it with them, explain what it all means um, and that, where the referrals have been sent to, and also um, explain how like the referral codes work for, for respite. And then we, we talked a little bit about the case conference, but that provided an opportunity to discuss the um, outcome of the assessment and to check the status of all the referrals that have been made to Mookin or any follow up medical um, appointments that the person might have needed. And then six months later, um, a support plan review would pop up on the system, which meant that I would manually go in and um, see if their home care package has been allocated and I would let Mookin or Gorini um, know about that and then they would action it. And then the service ends, but um, we sort of have an open door policy and we're always around to help troubleshoot or problem solve or, or provide that sort of consultation. Most of the points on the slide we've already sort of talked about, but ultimately um, we were functioning really well as an interagency and multidisciplinary team. Um, we had those strong partnerships, mutual respect, and we really valued each other. So when we're talking about value-based healthcare, um, what, what we do is we focus on measuring outcomes that matter most to that population group that we serve. And so for us in this situation, that was the older people and the community of Yarrabah. Um, we needed to look at if this model of care was making a difference. But we have these key performance indicators um, set by the Commonwealth. Shouldn't that give us a good idea of how we're doing and how effective our service is? The thing is, um, these KPIs are focused purely on timeliness of action um, rather than what we're doing. And you can see there on the screen, um, we, have, we do have periodic audits though, um, where the quality of our comprehensive assessment would be looked at, but there's no measure against cultural safety. Um, there's no measure or facility to reflect the unique needs of these diverse communities, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or, or remote communities. And there's also no measure to whether the person accesses the service we approve them for. So the question is, you know, is this a helpful measure of how effective um, the ACAT service is? And well, yes, if we focus on assessment only, but not really if we're concerned about what happens next. So I wanted to look beyond the usual KPIs and delve, delve, delve deeper into each client's story to see what the impact was of this new model of care. And um, I was able to do this by analysing data from our ACAT internal um, spreadsheet, referral spreadsheet. And I looked at every community Yarrabah referral since the beginning of 2019. I wanted to break this up and, and focus on three key areas. The point of referral, the point of assessment and access to care. So, Starting with referrals, you can see from this graph here that the number of total referrals more than tripled compared to 2019. Being on site and having greater accessibility to an ACAT assessor is what made the difference. Because we were on the ground, some of my role was around troubleshooting. So, you know, that might be helping people access respite or reactivating those home care package offers and talking to clients. But the figure in red is the referral for new assessments. And we had 33 in 2021 versus 13 in 2019. Um, it's also sort of worth noting that when I was looking at this data, I found um, referrals in 2019 were mostly from Mookin, the service provider. So I mean, they know the aged care system and they know how to navigate it, but 
when you compare that with 2021, they were mostly from the health service from Gurini, and they were now coming from um, nurses and GPs and health workers um, and clients were self referring too. You can see here um, the number of assessments completed. So more than 2.5 times the amount of assessments were completed um, compared to 2019. Uh, the community was in lockdown for most of 2020, so it's regarded as a bit of an anomaly. And this slide here looks at access to care after an assessment, which is, which is what we hadn't been able to measure before. Um, in 2019, of those eight people that got assessed and approved for home care packages, not a single one accessed these services until the new model of care came through two years later. Some were accessing community services via the Commonwealth Home Support Programme, but, but not that coordinated high level um, care from a home care package that they were approved for. It, it clearly highlights the, the many barriers that people were facing. And um, it's worth noting that after the new model of care, all of these clients were followed up with and they were able to access their care via the home care package. In terms of um, access to home care packages for the people in the new model of care, you can see in green that most people that were approved were either accessing care or they were in the process of signing up with Mookin or in the national queue waiting to have their package allocated by the Commonwealth. And this graph here demonstrates wait times from approval to uptake and the change over time with the new model of care. It's clear to see a drastic reduction in wait times when all of these three services are working closely together and uh, it demonstrates meaningful outcomes for clients. <coughs> so to summarise, um, when working as a integrated service with Mookin and Gurini, ACAT are providing more cost effective um, patient care, improved value for money. More people have been referred to ACAT, we had more people assessed and approved for government subsidised care, and more people were accessing their home care packages and they were accessing them quicker. There were better working relationships with, and communication with Gurini and Mookin. And there's some things that are tricky to measure, but, um, but we've definitely got a better understanding of the community. Um, we know the unique barriers and enablers for older people accessing care there and uh, the community have a, a much better understanding of the My Age Care system, how to refer, the different entitlements that they might have and, um, and carer support and respite processes and options. So that's, um, that's Yarrabar and I'll just hand back over to Sorel to talk about Cape York. Thanks Abby. Um, so yes, yeah, so Abby said we'll we'll now talk about how we adapted the model of care for Yarraba for the remote communities in Cape York. So um, ACAT historically had quite a good model of care for residents in the Cape communities. Um, we had a designated assessor who travelled to the communities on a reasonably regular basis with the um, Kent's Hospital Geriatrician Service. Um, this person had really well established relationships with like local stakeholders and had developed a more culturally appropriate version of the NSAF to assist with completing assessments. Um, unfortunately, this assessor retired um, before Abby and I started with the service. Um, resourcing was no longer available for the outreach trips to the Cape and COVID also had an impact on that. Um, and so as a result, um, a less effective model was implemented. So when Abby and I both started with the ACAT service, um, assessments for clients in Cape York were completed by phone. Um, due to the difficulties with contacting clients and carers by phone, um, often the modified assessment tool was sent to service providers or local clinicians who knew the client to complete on behalf of the client. Um, this information was then used to complete the assessment. So often assessments were completed with um, no or very limited involvement from the client or the carer. Um, this was identified as a fairly significant concern by the team leader prior to me. Um, and work had commenced to review and improve how the assessments were completed in the Cape, but unfortunately COVID hit um, the communities closed down, particularly during those first couple of waves of COVID um, and work in this area was put on pause. So when Abby and I picked this up, this work up again, I think it was around the beginning of this year, um, we noted really similar themes to what was observed in Yarrabah. 
So low referral numbers, high cancellation of referrals, and really patchy contact and relationships with local services. So whilst the model changed for the whole CAPE uh, with a consistent assessor um, put in place to look after those communities, we did work particularly closely with Aracoon. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, so Aracoon is a remote community in Cape York. Um, they have an Aboriginal medical centre, Akuna Pima, and also a hack centre run by Shivery. Um, and there's also a primary um, health clinic run by Queensland Health. Um, so really where this started is a nurse from Akuna Pima had reached out to me seeking assistance with arranging assessments for um, her patients and um, also to support community members to access care. So through the establishment of this relationship, um, I identified that there was a huge need in the community for assessment and access to care, uh, particularly residential respite. Um, so I guess concurrently to this process, um, I had received feedback from some of the Cairns Hospital medical staff um, who found that the um, limited access to residential respite for these communities was resulting in a really low threshold for local hospitals in the Cape to uh, transfer patients to Cairns. Often patients were transferred to Cairns uh, for you know, what they call social admissions. So you know, due to care stress and lack of access to services and supports. Um, so again, coincidentally, along with those two things happening, we received a bulk number of referrals from a fly in fly out um, non-Aboriginal consultant who was working with the local council and chivalry. Um, we really did our best to complete a good quality assessment for these bulk referrals via telehealth. However, the process was really less than ideal. Um, we had to take a very task focused approach to completing the assessments. Um, there were a lot of referrals um, and fairly significant time pressures for getting the assessments done. The assessments were facilitated by the consultant. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, we found that uh, many of the clients didn't know what the assessment was for. Um, we didn't have an opportunity to do the meet and greet process that we were doing in Yarrabah. And on reflection, Abby and I felt the process was um, quite uncomfortable and culturally unsafe at times. So the end result was pretty impressive from an ACAT KPI point of view. We got lots of assessments done in a very short space of time, but it was not at all client focused. Um, this wasn't value-based healthcare by the definition of this framework or probably by really any definition. Um, so we identified an opportunity to do better. Um, I'll hand over to Abby for the care pathway um, and what we did. Thanks, Sorel. Um, so as a clinician on the ground um, in this telehealth model of care uh, for a community, which I hadn't been to, and it was a really different experience to those which I'd encountered before. Um, with Yarrabah and so many other communities that I'd worked in, um, I had the opportunity for all that face-to-face -face discussion and the community engagement and learn a lot just from being immersed in community, but I didn't have that here. Um, so I thought about what I could do and my plan was just to listen as much as possible to the staff that were based in community. We didn't have established relationships um, and I knew from speaking with Sorel um, who, who a few of the key stakeholders were and I reached out to the nurse. Um, we set up a, a video meeting next time she was in community um, and that was with her, the, the new practice nurse as well that had started there and the long term GP to talk about the situation and how we were going to move forward. Um, in terms of shared need, um, I was quickly seeing the strengths of Aracoon. Um, there's a really strong sense of family, connection to culture and cultural practices are a priority for people. Um, it seemed the aged care service provider was really central to the community and the Apuna Pima team on the ground were so invested in understanding the aged care system and trying to help make a change in community for older people. So those initial calls and, and discussions is where we realised what wasn't working well too. <laughs> um, as key stakeholders, we'd all been working in silos, not necessarily through choice, but um, often just trying to keep our heads above water. Um, they'd, been, they'd been dealing with staff shortages and there's no agency staff available in a remote community for backup. So, you know, medical emergencies and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And the reality is it's it's a really small team in each organisation that are dealing with this every day. So the workload is already huge. There was a lot of frustration with access to care, um, both home care services and residential respite. And the aged care system is really difficult to navigate and it wasn't well understood by community. Just to talk a bit about residential respite though, this was one of the top priorities identified by community. So what had been happening is people had been approved for this service, but there was nowhere for them to access it. There was no residential aged care facility in Aracoon, and the closest a person could, could get residential respite would have been in Weeper Hospital, um, when they've just got one bed available for respite um, for Weeper and surrounds. And this was out of action because of COVID. So this meant that the only option was self-funding flights for themselves and an escort to go to Cairns and then pay for the fees. And that this just was not realistic for an older person living in Aracoon. So, you know, it was access to respite was, it was important for all the usual reasons that we see, but then magnified again. So um, in the riots that happened back in 2020, a lot of people had lost their houses. And for some of the people that we were talking to, they were still living with family in overcrowded households where they were waiting for repairs to be done. And there were just high levels of stress all around um, for the person, the family and the community providers. Sorrell's already spoke a bit about the challenges in the ACAP referral process, but this was definitely identified as a barrier. <laughs> So after that uh, community consultation, we, we got to work to design a model of care that was going to work for Aracoon and it happened over time and, and quite naturally. Repairing and rebuilding relationships was the priority. Um, getting to know the team at Apuna Pima, having very frequent open dialogue and trying to build relationships with Shivery, the service provider, um, acknowledging the struggles and the limitations of their service at times. Um, for teamwork, we set up a video a fortnightly video case conference between ACAT, Apuna Pima and Shivery. And the value of this was quickly realised by all of us. And telehealth attendance was consistent by all parties. We were working as a team. And it, as it evolved, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> as it evolved, the practice nurse took a lead role and the meeting has now become community led. They invite the primary healthcare service, uh, nurse navigators, and they've also had like special guests and in-services from Allied Health at Weeper Hospital. So as with Yarrabah, I had a very flexible approach to assessment, um, coming back to identify all that flexibility in the system and shifting the focus from me as a clinician to what was going to work for community. Um, once a referral had been received, I would aim to try and book in an assessment with either Shivery or a, a Puna Pima and, um, and start that process already by preparing with chart reviews, information gathering. Um, and, and if the client couldn't make that scheduled time, it meant that I was ready um, when they did present to clinic or, or Shivery. And in terms of setting up communication pathways, um, a mix of flexible and more structured approaches was preferred by all of us. The, the fortnightly meetings had a different format to Yarrabah because that's what was wanted. Um, we'd often start with a service update or talk about how things are going in community, um, any community events or sorry business and how this might impact the service that we're running. We talk about clients, um, feedback on any ACAT assessments that have been done or new referrals, um, new home care services that we'd been recommended to start or any health concerns for Puna Pima to follow up. And this was, um, this was really great for all of us. It was an efficient use of time. We'd then spend a bit of time discussing other business like the aged care system, how to overcome barriers, talking about other organizations and, and a lot of problem solving happened. Um, cultural safety felt like a challenge for me. Um, it's, it's not how I prefer to keep complete my assessments, but um, you have to work with the resources that you've got. And I guess the, this model reflected that clients were assessed in their own community and they were supported by someone that knew them well in their health service or a regular service provider, which was community controlled. Um, so the case conference, we've already talked about that and how what an integral part of it is of this model. Um, it helped make um, connections with other services like nurse navigators and um, that, that case conference created a forum that was beneficial for anyone else that wanted to work in with older people in these communities like nurse navigators or allied health. Um, reflecting back, uh, I think each of us had those moments when we thought 
oh, but that's not my job. Um, you know, all I'm supposed to do is the ACAT assessment. It's, it's not my job to, to follow up with all this respite stuff. And, and the team on the ground might be thinking, well, they said, we've got so much else to do. It, you know, it's not my job. We don't have time to facilitate these ACAT assessments. Um, but what we realised is that we really depended on each other for each of these things to, to be successful. Um, and I think what happened is we looked at where the edges of our scope and our roles sit and we we met there and we worked with that to make it happen i mean i put in a lot of effort knowledge and advocacy around access to respite and the team on the ground facilitated these acat assessments um i shared the frustrations with the staff at uh, shivery and apuna pima about respite and was a strong advocate for change but um, I had to try really hard to stay within the scope of my role and to indirectly support communities to, to work together to find a solution. Um, the staff on the ground were just instrumental to all of this. Uh, they um, they learned the process of an ACAT assessment through sitting through them and they were just fantastic at providing that cultural brokerage or explaining a question to the person in a more meaningful way and when English wasn't that person's first language they'd make sure that a family member or a health worker was there to support them and that's what you know an outcome driven workplace looked like in Arakoon. Focusing on the client journey so after plenty of consultation um, we made that referral process much easier um, it was often a verbal referral in case conference followed by a two page form and a GP summary. <clears throat> in, in terms of completing the assessments, um, though, we, we switched to a mainly video based assessment and um, it was really important from a cultural safety and clinical safety point of view to have them supported by um, someone they felt comfortable with and that knows them well. And in contrast to Yarrabah, where most assessments were completed in people's homes, in Arakoon, they were often incorporated as a part of the health check or, um, you know, with a Puna Pima or after they've had breakfast at Shivery. And so this meant that there was um, sort of informed consent as well. We did have uh, a couple of clients who were a bit apprehensive or hadn't been on video before and they didn't want to do the assessment. So I would always just stop and say, no, it's all right. Don't worry, we haven't got to do it. And then we might just have a bit of a yarn and build some rapport and um, they might feel comfortable and maybe we'd book it in for a later date. And that sort of changed into that meet and greet style um, that we had in Yarrabah. Um, I just tried to be as flexible as possible. Um, and then what would happen after the assessment is I'd send the report to the person that had facilitated it and then they would print it and give it to the client. Um, and then, you know, all of these things would be discussed at case conference. So I'll hand back to Sorrel to talk about the summary of outcomes. So through this process, we managed to improve working relationships with key stakeholders within the community. Um, a key enabler for this was the, as Abby said, the establishment of the case conference. Um, we had a significant number of clients assessed and approved for care um, and a system through case conference of improving the chances that clients will actually access care following assessment. Um, through the provision of advocacy and facilitating communication between stakeholders, um, clients are now able to access um, respite care at WEPA and ACAT has a dedicated assessor looking after the CAPE communities. Um, so I guess um, at just to conclude this presentation, Abby and I thought of really two, two key take home messages um, for everyone listening. So number one is the importance of co-design and interagency collaboration from the get go when designing and implementing a new service model. Um, that was really a key ingredient for both um, models. Um, and, and I think the fact that um, all, all stakeholders were really engaged and motivated to make a difference really um, resulted in the success of the models. Um, and I guess the other really important uh, take home message is allowing having the flexibility to allow your model of care to evolve um, based on the feedback that you get. Um, so again, that feedback was really driven by the communities and the clients receiving the services for us. Um, we did a lot of self-reflection and reflection on what was doing, what was working well and what wasn't working well and made changes based on that. And then there's also the importance of formal evaluation um, for um, informing changes. So that's the end of our presentation. I'll um, pass over to Emma again for any questions.
Thank, Thank you so much, Abby and Sorrel. That's such a fantastic presentation, such a good example of how listening to community can really help inform the design of models of care that improve outcomes. Um, I've heard some of it before and I still found it fascinating listening to it all again. So thank you so much for telling your story. Um, so we're now um, heading into a question and answer session. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat um, or the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, and I can communicate them to Abby and Sorrel. Um, but I'll kick off with a question that I have. Um, so Abby, you mentioned um, in the design for outcome section in, uh, when you're talking about Yarraba, um, how you would treat stakeholders as colleagues. Um, I would love to get your thoughts on what this would look like in practice and what this means to you. And you as well, Sarah, but we'll start with Abby. <laughs> um, thanks, Emma. So um, I guess what I mean by that is, um, although I might work for a particular organisation, you know, I work for ACAT and my ACAT team and my colleagues, when you go into community, you have to put a different hat on. Um, the people living in community are now your colleagues. So um, you're not just a visiting clinician, you're you are part of the community there and you have to respect the people that live and work there um, and, and treat them as equal, as equal partners. You have to leave your ego at the door and your expertise um, needs to be used in a different way. It's not about um, everything that you know going in there. It's about learning from them um, as much as possible um, and, and, and using your skills carefully um, together, I guess, I guess. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, do you have any thoughts, Sarah? No, I think I just concur with what Abby said. And I, I guess um, I know with particularly Queensland Health um, and a lot of the strategic plans that are coming out for um, services, particularly community-based services, partnerships, um, I think are a really key, key feature. We need to be working together with other services. So yeah, as Abby said, I think we need to let the the silos that are there are it's that us and them. We're Queensland Health; they're not Queensland Health, um, and and we really need to. It's a change in mindset, as Abby said. We need to see ourselves as a a whole team, regardless of what service we work for. And mm. I, I really think having like with that value based healthcare, having patient outcomes and what's important to the patient or client at front of mind really does help break down those barriers and silos between services and results in true partnership. Um, so a question from the audience, what strategies have you found effective in gaining meaningful feedback from clients in the community community about that process? Um, I guess I would just ask them very bluntly. Um, you know, well, when you're sitting with a client and asking them um, all these questions, um, I guess I I pick up on. Okay, let's split it into two. So with Yarrabah, when I was there in person, I can read the room very clearly. I am getting feedback from the health worker. Again, it's that working in partnership. Um, and I would just ask the client as well whether everything was going okay. We can stop. I can do it at a different time, or we could talk about this now. Um, I guess that would be my strategy is just to also just trust your gut too. Trust your gut and trust the people that you're working with and be led by the health workers. Is there anything you want to add to that? I guess just to add, and it's, um, I think um, Abby and I talked about the process of getting feedback for this model of care. And it was very much kind of informal verbal feedback, as Abby said, from clients during assessment, us using our observational skills of how clients were um, responding to assessment, both by telehealth and in person, um, and then feedback through case conferences. I guess um, with my previous experience doing this kind of a process in Roma, um, I really successfully used focus groups, um, which was, was basically what we used to inform the um, service redesign for ACAT. So we, we engaged not only like medical services and service providers, but also identified like rural areas have your CWA and your craft groups and that sort of a thing and actually went out and presented and talked to those people. Um, and I think that's a, it's a, I think informal is good because it's, you know, people tend to be quite honest and blunt with their feedback. You get good responses. Um, 
through with ACAT, we do have a client feedback form that's sent out to clients. But again, it's I don't think it's entirely suitable for the population that we're talking about with this model of care. Um, but, but I mean, that's another mechanism. It, it does work in certain areas, but I, it wasn't something that we were able to really apply or use in this situation. So we're getting to the near the end of time, but I just want to ask you one more question each. You, you could go, go back, back to before you'd gone, gone through all of these processes. What is the one piece of advice that you'd give to yourself? We'll start with you, Abby. That's a really tricky question, um, Emma. I think um, for me, is that focus on relationship focused care. So if it feels right and um, and you've got meaningful relationships, um, stay stay true to that. Stay true to um, having meaningful relationships with community as your priority. I think for me, probably, I guess something I would change or give myself advice on was partic like particularly reflecting on that whole process for Aracoon when we got those bulk referrals. I think like my my spidey senses were not comfortable from the outset with that whole whole process, and I think I was just so keen to go, wow, this is an opportunity. They really need assistance. That I think we did jump in with maybe not taking as much of a considered approach as we could have. Um, so I think my advice would have been, um, particularly in that situation, if it didn't feel right, and we noticed that on reflection, um, that it probably would have been better to start with that engagement with other stakeholders before jumping in and doing those assessments. So trust your instincts and act on them. Thank, Thank you both so much, much um, for joining us today. That was such a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Um, and we really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. Um, we'd also like to really thank, again, Hester and Tom for your generous support of today's webinar. Um, the Queensland Allied Health Framework for Value-Based Healthcare that was mentioned throughout today's webinar is available um, on the Queensland Health website if you're interested to find out more. Um, also, if you're interested to know more about value-based healthcare, um, the Australian Centre for Value-Based Healthcare has regular webinars on topics, um, different topics related to value-based healthcare. Um, you can find out more about them by subscribing to our newsletter um, or visiting the Australian Centre for Value Based Healthcare website. Thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at a, one of our upcoming events soon.